I'm excited to be here as an artist performing tonight at the kickoff of Series Fest. All eyes focused on the Mile High City this weekend, an ambitious and exciting new festival called Series Fest. This weekend's Series Fest, an international television pilot festival. Denver's hosting Series Fest, uniting artists and television executives and producers to find the next big hit. We have the TV element and then music too. I love the combination. Television is where all the big risks are being taken, where the most exciting work is happening. And this is a festival that celebrates that. It's a really great idea to do a festival for serialized material. I think it's cool. It's kind of ahead of its time. I'm Sam Esmail, creator of Mr. Robot. I'm Gemma Chan. It's such a great idea to have a festival dedicated to TV like this. Finally, there's an independent avenue for people who want to just go into the TV business. It's exciting. This is an era where TV is having a real renaissance. What's happening with the evolution across platforms is just incredible. The lines are starting to blur. It's just wonderful to have an outlet for all of the creativity that's happening in television and in new digital media right now. The fact that there's this, there's Series Fest, which allows you to put it in front of an audience and gives you a platform to put it out there, like that's the most impactful thing as artists that we can ever hope for. Our lineup is bigger and more diverse than ever. The festival's a magnet for amazing talent. We've really expanded our year-round programming and we're no longer just a six-day festival in Denver. We're really a full year-round organization, which is really exciting. We are very yeah. excited yeah. to be here. So as two women founders, supporting women has always been at the forefront of our missions. And we, uh, we started a featured women platform, which we house all of our women initiatives under. Last year, we announced our Women's Directing Mentorship, where we open submissions to female directors. The prize, right, is to shadow an episode, to study under one of our directors. But the goal is to mentor. Come to Series Fest this year, because you'll meet people. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Randy Kleiner, co-founder and CEO of Series Fest, and welcome to Series Fest Season 6, Day 3. We have lots of incredible panels, network events, independent pilots, international series, and more for you to explore over the next several days. So make sure to check out everything on SeriesFest.com. I am so excited to introduce our next panel, a behind-the-scenes look of one of my favorite shows of the last few years, the award-winning drama Killing Eve. Join members of the creative team to discuss the inventive artistry and world building that goes into the BBC America hit. 
Let's welcome to the screen our moderator, Stacey Wilson-Hunt, and the creative team from Killing Eve Season 3. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see you. Let me introduce all of our amazing talent here from Killing Eve. We have executive producer Sally Woodward Gentle, director yep. Miranda Bowen, and director Shannon Murphy. Welcome to all of you. How is everyone holding up today? Oh, good. Mm. Thank you. With Shannon, it's 2 a.m. for Shannon. So, <laughs> <laughs> Shannon's in Australia. We thank you so much for uh, sacrificing your precious sleep to be with us. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't want to waste any time diving into talking about season three, which is so wonderful. Congratulations. But out of the gate, I do want to talk to Sally about something um, very timely and relevant that took place recently, a bit of a controversy on Twitter, where your writer's room posted a Zoom image of the entire writing staff celebrating the end of season four's writing. Yeah. And there was, some, there was some discussion online about the whiteness of the photo. Uh, which yeah. is something that all of us are talking about. We're all very sensitive to these matters. And I, yeah. I would love for you to just talk about what conversations have you had with your staff since then? Because this really just unfolded in a relatively short period. And it what, did, and yeah. just sort of take me, after it happened, which obviously there was no malintent with this post, but it certainly spurred interesting conversations. So tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, you're absolutely right. And thank you for asking about it because, you know, the, um, makeup of the room should be more racially diverse than it is and you know we're really aware of that and i take full responsibility for it you know you look at that room and it's it's full of brilliant female writers we've got a really strong lgbtq contingent but it's not good enough and we need to do better we should do better on a show like killing you should be able to do better um and we've all you know, had long talks and lots of soul searching. And, you know, we can come up with excuses, come up with platitudes. We can talk about the people that we've spoken about in the past, but we've got to do better. Um, and all of our writers know we're going to do better, but also the production, you know, from the ground up, the entire production we're looking at in terms of how we can make concrete change, because um, it's incredibly important to us. Um, and it's got to be change that lasts and is effective. Um, I think this is an extraordinary moment and we've got to make a difference. It's not good enough. Well, thank you. And, and we will get sort of further into some of those issues toward the end of the conversation, but I thank you for addressing that because no one can deny it. it's incredibly, incredibly important. Yeah. So in terms of season three of Killing Eve, were you locked before the pandemic hit? How did it affect your post um, rollout? Because I know a lot of series uh, had to either just show, have truncated seasons, you were editing from home. What was your situation on that front? Is Miranda looking very sort of... Um, <laughs> 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 we were lucky, we had picture locked, but we Good, were okay. deep, deep in post. And because we're uh, quite neurotic, we were already thinking that, you know, we could get locked down. So. We'd looked at how you can remove uh, machines off site, how you can do uh, the grade off site, how you can do the sound mix off site. I mean, music is always off site anyway, and just like you, you slot it in. But the difficult thing is there was loads of um, CG that needed to be done. Um, and what we really didn't know was how machines, if you move them away from each other, are gonna to talk to each other and whether they're gonna do it properly. And then of course, everybody's spoken about the issues around um, ADR and how you get that recorded when you physically didn't even want to put, you know, deliver a mic to somebody's house even. Mm. Um, and actually we found out the iPhone is, iPhone under a, under a duvet is the best. <laughs> and and right. even our, our, our brilliant sound team said, you know, and they said, listen, this is going to do us out of an, a degree of our business, but they felt the performances were better from home. Hmm. You know, there was, it was, it was quite interesting. Wow. But we did it, but we're not the only people that did it. You know, it, we all had to dive in and work out new ways of working. There, I've heard a lot of stories of amazing ingenuity in the last three months. So, it's, yeah. so we, I think people have been forced to think in those ways, which I think can serve us later, you know, yeah. should we be in the situation again. Exactly. I'd love, to, I'd love to talk to Shannon and Miranda about your journeys to directing Killing Eve. Shannon, tell me a little bit about your life growing up in Hong Kong, Singapore, Africa, and Australia. What is that like? <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, it's the only life I know really. So, um, I can't, um, compare it to anything else, but I, uh, my parents, uh, are in interesting fields. My father worked in hotels and my mother's an occupational therapist and they met in Africa. And, um, so I was born there and then, yeah, moved to Hong Kong where I did most of my schooling, um, primary school and high school. And then I briefly lived in Singapore, which was, um, a wonderful experience as well but it um i really loved living and growing up in asia and i think um it really informed the kind of slightly out of the box stories that i'm interested in and uh definitely the color palette that i use mm. in a lot of my work i think is inspired by the very sort of neon and bright colors of hong kong so yeah it's definitely very influential on my work and who were your earliest influences in terms of directors? Did you have more of an international bent? And were you aware of American artists? What was your, uh, I guess, melting pot of creativity there? Well, my mom's actually American. So okay. I, was Amer I was aware of American artists, but um, <laughs> I was a theater director for years. So I actually found a lot of inspiration from theater directors that I love, like Katie Mitchell or Thomas Ostermeyer or Castellucci. So, I only really moved into film and television probably about five or six years ago. So I can't say that I was like a diehard film fan <laughs> and had all those influences. It's actually something that I've only learned more recently having gone to film school a bit later in life. So, yeah. Well, I think it's great to have that non-traditional background because there are enough traditional schooled <laughs> folks to make up for that. So I'm sure, I'm sure you've brought a lot of nuance to your work because of that. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Miranda, tell me a little bit about your background. You had a similarly kind of non-traditional environment growing up. Tell me I about know, that. I was actually thinking I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I knew that about you, Shannon. And I don't know this about you. <laughs> the background. But I'm now wondering whether we ever crossed paths and weren't even aware of it. Yeah, um, yeah Africa, but I, yeah, I didn't get any further afield than, than, the, than the vertical from England down to Cape Town, really. I sort of didn't stray too far from that longitude. So it was Africa hmm. and Europe. Um, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong definitely didn't figure. But um, yeah, it could have been Africa. Um, I, I suppose, yeah, like Shannon, I, I think just having quite an international background definitely opens up different influences. And it's always very hard to quantify, you know, what the difference would be had, had I grown up in one place, um, would I still I have the same influences would I've become a film I don't know I just know that I was always very very attracted to visual imagery and stimulus and um and my memories of Africa were the intensity of color and light sort of seared onto my retinas from a really really young age and I'm I'm sure that has something to do with with a love of cinema. Um, my mother was actually a stage actress, so I grew up in the wings of various rickety theatres around Europe and, and wow. Africa. Hmm. And, um, and that had a magic all of its own. And I remember feeling distinctly always very disappointed when, when going onto the, onto the stage set, you'd suddenly go through one of the doors that you'd allegedly led to an off-stage kitchen and there would be no kitchen there and I find that incredibly disappointing and I think in a way film allows you to sort of fill in the kitchen and the dining room and the you know the field beyond and, and that feels quite satisfying that there is something beyond the flats um, in film. so yeah I'm sure and she was a great great lover of musical theatre and so Rodgers and Hammerstein and um, every, I mean, every, every American musical, West Side Story, Guys and Dolls, all those 50s musicals were really big in our household and would be belted from the, <laughs> from the rafters. And, and so there was, I guess, a sense of theatre and drama was always there, which, which actually, I have to say, contrasted very dramatically with my father's quite dour job as a civil servant. Um, roaming around the place and, uh, and and there's a great sort of sense of conflict. I remember feeling as a really young child between my mother's kind of <coughs> love of theater and flamboyance with these terrible, terribly sort of staged diplomatic dinner parties that she had to stage for all these, you know, very polite and sort of slightly repressed diplomats who, you know, 
were trying their best to say please and thank you in as many different languages as possible, but never actually really communicating properly with one another. Um, and uh, yeah, she was quite mischievous and, and used to used to do her best to try and bring things to life a bit. And um, I think wasn't very popular with, with the diplomatic service. I, <laughs> I love this. Yeah. I can really see this playing out as a YA film. So really keep that in mind <laughs> because this would make a great movie. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't worry, the script's been written. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and Sally, you, you've you been a constant in Killing Eve from the beginning. And during that time, you've worked with a lot of different producers, obviously starting with Phoebe, and Phoebe has gone on to become Phoebe and change the world Phoebe. in the meantime. <laughs> but yeah. a lot of different writers, too. And I'm wondering, what have been your biggest challenges in maintaining the consistency of the tone in the series, which is so distinct, yeah. but also kind of maintaining loyalty to Luke Jennings' novels, which are the source material, but then also being open to new perspectives. And because that is not an easy thing to do season after season. No, it's not. It's, and, it's, and it's brutal and it's brutal for everybody. I mean, the show is enormously good fun to do, but it is, it's, I do think it is really, really hard. It's really hard for the writers um, to do. And... Um, and actually production, because you're turning around eight hours from a standing start year on year. Um, and Luke gave us um, amazing, two amazing characters and this amazing dynamic of a sort of the hidden world of MI6 and the obsession between these two women. And, and Phoebe picked that up and ran with it. And then the actors came along and they filled those characters with even more life. And as they, it's really interesting, because you do, you know, other than this season, all of our lead writers have been brand new each season. But it's, it's great to have their perspective as a viewer on what has come before, because quite often what you watch as a viewer is sort of not what you're carrying around as baggage as part mm. of the team. So you can impart everything that we have had in terms of discussions about where those characters have come from, what we think their backstories are, where they think they're going, what is the truth of their relationship? What's the truth inside their hearts and their souls? But you've also got people coming from the outside going, yeah, but I've seen it and I think it looks like this and wouldn't that be a really interesting thing to go down and the tone is really tough but but that isn't just it's not just the writers you know the, the actors help with it and then the directors come along and they bring their own um, interpretation of those um, of those performances um, and I mean the tone is the, is the trickiest thing to do but I think that we can, there, there is sort of tonal ebb and flow in the show as well. I think there's, um, it's a bit like um, Shannon's episode five, when you go back to Russia mm -hmm. in comparison to um, Miranda's brilliant episode four, when you broke up the perspective into four different characters, you know, you can flip it a bit and you can go darker in some of it, but it's the naughtiness that I think you need mm. to sort of keep an eye on. Naughtiness and emotional <laughs> truth. It's a mm. really long, probably really boring answer. <laughs> no, Sorry. it's actually, no, that's fascinating. And, and everything you've just described is what ends up on the screen. So what you've discussed yeah. is apparently what you have, were able to accomplish. That's great. And in terms of, and you, you were, that offered the perfect segue, I'd love to talk about what the directors do bring because the directors are not there all the time. They're not there throughout the entire season. And Miranda and Shannon, I think a lot of people don't understand when you are directed to hire an episode of television, I think a lot of people think you walk on set, everything's been prepped for you and you just say action. And that's obviously not the case at all. So Miranda, I would love for you to explain just briefly, what is the process when you find out you're directing, let's say uh, episode 303, and two, one and two are already in progress. Are you then on your own prepping 303? Is there just a whole other unit of people prepping that episode? And then you're also prepping 304. Tell me how that works logistically and timing wise. Um, I think that the role of the director works differently in the UK. I should just start off by saying okay. that in that I think generally you're a lot more involved from a lot earlier on and you remain throughout the whole of the edit and then through to the sound design, the music, the right to the final moments of CGI going in. So. Hmm you feel very beholden and invested to the project. And I mean, 
each director works differently. I find it, I, I find that I can't work on something unless I am completely invested in it. And so there would, there, I, the, I'd never really, I mean, I'd worked on episodic drama before, but never something as large and as all encompassing as Killing Eve. And um, because I suppose there are two seasons that have gone already, there was a, there was a moment of just trying to catch up on a technical and cultural level to understand how the production worked and what the ethics and values of it were, how people communicated with each other, what the best way of contacting the art director might be, all those sort of logistical things that just just a slightly characteristically different in each production. Um, but I suppose there is a huge um, security in the sense that you know that this is a is a billowing beast that will keep going regardless of what you do but you want to give your best to it because I mean particularly on Killing Eve everyone is working so hard and everyone is investing so much and hours become limitless and you just you just go for it and it's a challenge it's you know it, it's definitely a challenge and I think um, I think it's like anything the more you invest the more you get back out of it and I and I feel that the relationships are everything and and I think relationships worked really, really well on Killing Eve, and they felt like, for the most part, I mean, obviously, it's very, it's a very personal thing. There was a good line of communication, and if you needed stuff, then someone would respond to it. I never, you know, you always feel as though you're very well cared for and carried, hmm. and um, and that's a great, well, testament to Sally's investment and and care. Hmm. Um, but also I think the, the program as a, or the sort of culture of the, of the program as a whole is one that has a very strong identity and people who work on it are very committed and, you know, they're there for the long run. They're, they're not going anywhere. So, and that's and what helps, makes it good. And it helps the show is so female, so filled with that support and that energy. I just have, a, I just have to guess as a viewer that that makes a huge difference in your work. <laughs> it does. You know, it definitely does. I mean, I love I love working with female writers and that's not to say there aren't great male writers out there as well, but it's not something I've had a huge opportunity to do so far. And it's mm -hmm. only really in the last year or two that we've started to see many more talented female voices coming through and who are, who are actually finally being, being given the opportunity to, to put them you know, their voice on the screen, you know, I think there are a lot of people in development that never quite get to the point of production. And yeah. so it's, it's very, you know, it's really nice to see that that's finally happening. It can, it, we can all do a lot better, but yeah. it's, it's dribbling through, it's getting going. And, and hopefully this will, you know, set a precedent for the next generation and it'll become easier and easier. Yeah. So, yeah, I hopefully. think femaleness has felt like a really galvanizing force on this, on this show. Hmm. And Shannon, for you, what is the thrill, but also the fear of stepping onto a set, stepping into a show that is new to you? What, what are the emotions that you feel, obviously wanting to do well, wanting to fit in? A lot of directors have described it to me as sort of being the new kid in school, <laughs> wanting to, you know, be part of this camaraderie, not wanting yeah. to stand out. But also, how do you balance that? Okay, I'm in charge now. I know you liked the other person who did 302, but I'm doing this one. <laughs> and how yeah. do you assert yourself, but also it's so hard too. And women, unfortunately, have talked about that, how this is harder for them than it has been for their male counterparts. So tell me that journey for you. Um, yeah, look, I think when I was starting out directing about you know five or six years ago, sometimes when I would walk onto a set, I could definitely feel, you know, because of also how I look, um, I've often been considered the intern. Um, and so <laughs> there's like a real confusion that how I could possibly be the director with like my blonde kind of childish haircut. So people um, have actually mistaken you for the intern? Many times, yeah. Um, they go, oh, you must be the new attachment. And I'm like, no, I'm directing this blog. Um, so <laughs> I have to kind of shift everyone's mentality a bit. And then we've sometimes, you know, it's shifting, but, um, you know, crews are still very male dominated in general. And I think early on in my career, I could feel sometimes that there was a slight resistance to have a female in a leadership position. That's really changing now. And it's definitely wasn't the case on Killing Eve, um, which has had so many female directors already. Um, but for me, the challenge on this was coming on 
and I've only worked in Australia prior to this. So I wanted to see if there was a difference between working in the UK or Australia. But I have to say, because the crew on Killing Eve is actually quite small, considering how massive this show is. And so it's quite easy to form relationships with people um, very quickly. And, and the team has been the same since the beginning of um, the series. So everyone is um, very close knit and very um, community oriented and, and very um, easy to work with, I found. I guess the challenge though coming into a new series is always, um, I think with the actors, because they know the characters in the world um, so deeply that you have to offer something that's going to be really inspiring to them. Mm -hmm. And I find um, that's the big challenge because if you don't offer them something new, they kind of don't need you in a way. Mm. Um, and so it's really important to find that new psychology um, to keep them inspired and, and remind them why it's, um, it's such a joyful piece to work on really, because it's so easy for them to fall in their patterns like it is for anyone. Um, and it's about sort of busting them out of that and, and keeping it alive for them. Hmm. It's so funny. I've had actor friends tell me the frustration they feel when they know the material better than the director. And, and that's always like a, a chasm between the, the, the two pieces. That's very interesting. Yeah. I also, though, before I come on board a show, I watch all the previous eps and I completely steal ideas. Like I will watch other directors work and then steal frame grabs all the time of like, <laughs> oh my God, I love that scene or, you know, that image. Or, and then I often just take it to the cinematographer. Like, and this was, you know, we, we used Julian Court, who's done so much of the series and is such a master of the look. And I was like, remember that scene you did? I want to recreate that. I, you know, and I, you, you just, you know, you steal, steal stuff. Yeah. Well, it's there and it's been done. So it's, it's right for stealing, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sally, I'd like to talk about something that's so pivotal to the series, but also I don't think it's the focus of the series, which is the use of violence in the show, Yeah, which is obviously so much a part of Villanelle's character um, and really a driver of a lot of plot points. How has how you depict violence sort of ebbed and flowed and, and evolved? Because it's almost like just when we think we've seen a new way she can kill someone. Oh, she kills someone a different way. <laughs> so sort of how yeah. do you do that without becoming cartoonish? And I'm thinking that the scene with the golf club and, yeah. and then when, when Eve is stepping on his chest and that, I was like, oh my God, I thought I'd seen everything and now here's this other scene. So my point is the way you're doing it is so artful and it feels scary, but it's also just before it's too much, you sort of pull back each time. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about balancing that because for a show like this, it's hard for it not to become kind of over the top, I have a feeling. It is, it's, it's really tricky. And actually my, my sort of threshold for what's, um, for violent that's, I've got a quite a high threshold. So lots of people got to sort of pull me back down about it. <laughs> but, you know, there is, um, it's, you know, we, we, we don't want to go too cartoony, but you're absolutely right. Like the golf club SWAT, I think was almost slapstick, but then Eve crushing Dasha's chest was desperately right. emotional and really, really dark. And, and that again, that comes down to the, the talent of the performers and the talent of the directors, not to make things feel awkward or feel like they clash. And, you know, for example, like the, um, the Rose Garden kill in, um, in Miranda's episodes, which I, I just adore because it is so full of character for Eve and actually weirdly so full of, for me, I, I just find it so um, tantalizingly glorious that this poor woman doesn't know that this girl who's cutting the, the good heads off her roses is, a uh, is, you know, a killer with psychopathic tendencies. And, you know, the, the, the humor of her, you know, pretending to be a monster to, stare, to scare the, the hiccups away, I think for me feels like a really good Killing Eve balance where mm -hmm. you can enjoy the irony behind it. And visually, it's really fun to watch. You get a fa fantastic sort of insight into Villanelle's psyche um and then the kill is quite fun and quite different i mean we do spend quite a lot of going how can we kill this one that we haven't done before <laughs> that right. isn't actually too gruesome as well because mm. we don't want to go gruesome you know if right. you think about the episode first season episode one with the the hairpin in the eye which I, i've spoken to friends they went oh no i just had to turn off after that point <laughs> but i think you don't actually see anything and i right. think it becomes 
it's much more effective, I think, it's sort of the, 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 the less you see. And I love how Miranda shot that, the Rose Garden Kill as well, because, you know, she shot it through the glass of mm -hmm. the greenhouse as well. And then you have options in the edit as well, you know, how much do we want to, you know, be sucked into this and how much do we want to stand back? So all the time it's about, it's, it's right from conception through to the edit, to the choice of how close you go, when you pull back, when you cut out, um, what sounds you put on it, you know, sounds massively important, what track you put over the top of it. You know, you've got all of those choices which are constantly about your emotional response to that particular moment. And, it, and for me, it also seems the use of violence is more impactful when it's in an environment we're not used to seeing it in. For example, yeah. this beautiful English garden during the day, which is, you know, one of the more pleasant experiences a person can have. And then suddenly this woman's yeah, gone. Exactly. So it's not like, and I like that there's a lot of violence during the day outside. It feels yeah. we're not used to that. We're so used to the horror film trope of opening the door, the long hallway, a house, that kind of thing. So yeah. I think it's, you're, you're ruining a lot of environments for people by making them scary <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but I think that's right. You know, to keep the daytime thing is really important because also we've seen a load of, you know, things with, you know, dark, you know, you know, dark alleys and people sort of creeping up behind you. So it's about subverting all of that and making um, the threat of Villanelle feel a bit more real because it's in spaces that feel comfortable. Right. It's so true. So I'd love to play a couple of clips from this past season. And the first is uh, from the director, excuse me, from 303, which Miranda directed, is one of my favorite scenes with Fiona Shaw, who is so incredible, in the bathtub. And she's getting a debriefing from the actor Mo Jafari about her son's death. So let's watch that. And what about the coroner's report? So no signs of a struggle, no evidence of asphyxiation or internal injury. Basically, he was absolutely fine until he hit the ground. May I? So, the head of the MPS is still saying it's suicide despite the lack of note or motivation. That is reassuring. It'd be really unsettling if he actually got something right. Geraldine, sir, could you come straight in? Oh. Wow. Oh, get over it, Eve. I have all my best thoughts in the bath. If Mo can manage, you can. I haven't looked up in 10 minutes. Did you get Kenny's thumb drive back from the police? At quite a cost, yes. I'd rather not know. Oh, I'll meet you oh. downstairs. Who's that? Our bitter pill representative. I invited him before I knew this meeting was in a bathroom. Move, you just passed me a towel. So Miranda, for me, this clip is very emblematic of how wonderfully Killing Eve blends darkness, but also in totally absurd context. We're not used to seeing someone of Fiona's character's stature in a tub drinking wine while being debriefed by someone who works for her. <laughs> so tell me about how you shot this scene. Were you actually in a, fit, a, a real location or was that a set? Tell me a little bit about the, the camera work there. It, it, it was actually a set that was marginally bigger than the real location. <laughs> it didn't look added. big. No, I was expecting <laughs> it to be bigger. It was quite a squeeze. I mean, it was, quite, it was possibly the most surreal day I had on the entire shoot. Um, and Fiona being Fiona was very insistent on not wearing any modesty gear at all. And um, yeah, poor. <laughs> Poor other actors who had to sit there with her whilst, whilst people <laughs> did things with cameras and tried to get more bubble bath in the bath and special effects people came in to mix the bubble bath up to make it and Fiona sat there. I think quite it. No, I don't think I know because I was I dipped my head around the corner to see if everything was okay, not wanting to intrude and add to the m melee of people already in there. And she was she was quoting she was quoting Shakespeare as she lay there between <laughs> that that seems like something she would do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I and I shared a look with Raj, the actor who plays Mo, and I, I could sense that there was now no division between the character he was playing on screen and the character <laughs> who he was on screen. That awkwardness and discomfort was fully embedded, 
and that he embodied it entirely and that was all he needed in order to play the scene. Um, so it, yeah, it was, it was very challenging to shoot. Um, despite the fact that it was a set still. Um, and it's all those things that happen when you think, oh, it's just a bathtub and it's a bathroom, but actually to keep the water hot when there's no running water, to keep the bubbles in exactly the right place so no one, right. no one questions what they're seeing and if they're seeing too much or too little of what they should be seeing, right. um, to make sure you can get angles that actually get, that make, you know, allow us to believe the characters are talking to each other and that's, dynamic and that tension was yeah was very challenging but it had a I mean it's just wonderfully surreal I mean Fiona is such a incredibly knowledgeable and effusive and generous actress and and the fact that she was so blithe about the whole thing I mean obviously different actors cope with modesty very differently and she is a woman of such stature both both sort of morally and spiritually and in terms of her acting ability that she was able to lie there for I think it was probably about three hours with very little break getting out. <laughs> I mean, she didn't want to get out. She was she was sort of on her in her throne. It was her throne <laughs> moment. Well her, she had a her captive audience, so. <laughs> well her skin was um, very moisturized. <laughs> Sorry. I said her skin was very moisturized by the end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I can't remember what the actual question was now. It was just a sudden, the whole memory. <laughs> but that, no, that, that ex expertly captured exactly what I wanted, wanted to know, because I have a sense, not being a director, that those moments are in some ways harder than a large outdoor scene with action because of the proximity of all the players. I have yeah. to imagine that's very challenging. Well, very well yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And, and I would love to watch a clip from a very different episode, uh, which is Shannon's episode the, uh, in which Villanelle travels back to Russia. I love this episode because who knew she even had people who even liked her. So that was a revelation. <laughs> and there's a scene where they're at the table and they start to sing Crocodile Rock by Elton John. So let's give a look at that. So this episode was so fun for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously another location change, which is very killing Eve because you guys like to stack your schedules with as many location changes as possible. But where did you shoot this episode, by the way? I was very curious. Uh, this was shot in a um, small village called Komandau, which was in Romania and it was on the oh, top okay. of a mountain. Oh wow. And um, they, it was a, a village that had actually never been shot before. So it was pretty incredible to go in there um, with a film crew. And um, so we used a lot of the local villages as extras and, um, and worked really hard to make it look as much um, like an authentic Russian village as we could. Yeah, I was going to ask about uh, the actors. So those are all mostly locals? In the, the carnival scene and people walking Oh, around. yeah, in the carnival scene, yes, yeah. Okay. But not the family members. No, they were okay. from all over. Yeah. Okay. And tell me about blocking that scene. I, it's so funny because we're so used to Villanelle being, she's the aggressor. 
And here she is, she almost feels like a little girl at the table and she's overwhelmed by all of these big personalities and her nephew who's obsessed with Elton John, that kid is so funny by the way. And just seeing the look on her face as they all start to sing the song and she, there's this glimmer of humanity that we hadn't seen in her before. So tell me a little bit about, I guess, directing Jody in that moment who's so wonderful and balancing the humor with also telling this story about this young woman who's just had so much ridiculous sadness in her life too. Yeah, look, the way we approached that, you know, the, the blocking was around that very small round table, which we knew would be naturally comedic, um, just in its shape and size. But what was um, interesting was Jodie was uh, very clear that she didn't want to meet the family before we started shooting, because really? she was the outsider and she really wanted to just experience it fresh on the day and so by the time we did shoot the crocodile rock scene she had met them but she hadn't ever seen what we rehearsed which was them beginning to sing that and i'd rehearsed that a few days beforehand <laughs> and um in the rehearsal i worked out very quickly that they <clears throat> are all really terrible singers and not even <laughs> not even like funny um bad like really terrible and when they first sang i remember the, the dialect coach budgie and i were just like oh god like you can't do that that's terrible um and i thought oh what am i gonna do uh and so i i worked out which could sing enough just to get away with it and which ones i had to have mime and um <laughs> and what was great though was when jody first heard them sing i'm sure as villanelle she was just reacting to the natural sound i, <laughs> remember, I remember that sally um came on set that day and i wanted to die because i was like oh no like because i was like this will be really funny i promise but actually when you were just listening to it it was just really off and awkward which was perfect for the scene um uh, but what i did was i had them all really commit to how they physicalized joy and, mm -hmm. and danced in that moment of collectively coming together as a family um, in doing something that they do as a ritual together um, all the time. And then that beautiful moment where they um, go to include Villanelle and she resists, but then eventually gives in. Um, for me, the blocking of that final beat was really important because I, I knew that I wanted to do that tracking shot backwards away from her just before she starts to sing. Mm. Um, and so a lot of time was spent getting that really right. Um, but I really, you know, I, I loved watching them just uh, explore their characters physically through dance and, and we workshopped that. Um, but, you know, I just think, I think actors are amazing and, and what they come up with, um, is so brilliant. I really, um, yeah, I, it was, it was a very playful day for sure. And, and Tammy, the young actor that you're talking about, he mm -hmm. just absolutely adored, um, that moment and getting to, to embody Elton. It was, um, <laughs> I think it's a very special moment for him. And was Crocodile Rock written into the script or was that a song you chose later? No, it was written into the script. Okay. Um, yeah. And Suzanne Heathcote who wrote it was, um, she said she wrote it and just never really thought that that would actually be able to happen because, mm -hmm. you know, Elton John is so famous and, you know, everybody knows. Well, that, that was my question. So was it much. hard to get that cleared? And how did you? Well, Sally knows more about that than me. <laughs> Tell me was, about that, Sally. I was dreading you were going to ask. And actually, I think that there was, there was quite a few people behind the scenes. Not me. I had absolutely nothing to do with the magic of that. But mm. there were other people who reached out personally to to Elton to say, can we make this happen? And they made it happen, which was really- Wow. Really I assume magical. he's a fan of the show. He has great taste. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, he, um, I think he did, he did tweet Jody after the scene, I think, and said oh, he did? how much oh. he loved it, um, <laughs> which is great. I think there was sort of mutual love there. Um, and it was a, you know, it's a love letter to Elton, that episode, you know, hmm. Hot Boris is completely driven by his, he knows everything about him, you know, and he, he, you know, he hears Villanelle's talking in English and wonders if she's from Pinner, which is where <laughs> Elton's from. So it's, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a lovely thing. That's no, it was very charming and, and building on that rocket man, uh, trend from last award season. That was very smart. <laughs> <laughs> we all still had that ringing in our ears. Yeah. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, before we run out of time, that the future of the series sort of in the short term in terms of, okay, season four has been written. What, what information are you waiting for now to get back into production? I know 
Hollywood is struggling right now to come up with its guidelines and you know safety concerns for, for going back to work. What have you heard about the, the future of, at least for your show, and what, what do you hope you can contribute to creating a safe environment for your directors and your, and your cast and crew? It's, it's really hard. And actually, you know, I think I, I, you know, I've spoken a little bit to Miranda about it. I haven't spoken to, to, to Shannon about it. But, you know, it, it, it feels really stressful because every day you're trying to update your thinking about how this might work. Right. And, the, you know, there are shows like Killing Eve where, you know, we need to go abroad. You've got to show that. You need people to, to actors to be, you know, very intimate with each other. Um, I think we were just talking today actually just about our, select. we haven't finished writing, we just were arcing it at the moment. So we haven't, mm -hmm. all the scripts aren't written. Um, and, and we're just saying to the actors, listen, just don't box us into a corner in terms of our locations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where the show has got flexibility is we do start so much from a position of their emotional journeys across the thing and making that feel truthful. And then the plot sort of works around that. So it's not like you're going, I'm really sorry, but this just has to be, um, I know, Guatemala, or this just has hmm. to be so, so. It's all about their emotional relationships. So you're so, leaving cush cushion for, for sort of margins of change later yeah, on. Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. So it's just like, okay, you know, as long as this feels truthful and those dynamics feel right, we could move it here or we could move it there. Um, it's, it's tricky, but we don't want to compromise it in terms of the storytelling or in terms of the sort of the visual pleasure of it. Hmm. Um, and we're just sort of plumping for a date and we'll just head for that date and see what happens. Hmm. Um, but it's, you know, it is tricky, you know, we're in soft prep now and we're just, you know, we're all just on zoom and we're probably going to do early recce by sort of Google earth. You know, it's going to be really, you know, <laughs> Right. Use technology as much as possible, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Sally, getting back to what we talked about at the top of our interview, the diversity issue and what each of us can do better on that front moving forward. Tell me a little bit about the roadblocks that you've witnessed writers of color, directors of color, crew members, executives, the, the sort of impediments that they face in the system and when they possibly can sort of get cut off from being considered for jobs? And, and how do you think we can help eliminate those roadblocks? And what do you think you can do as executive producer to create a more diverse environment for your, for your series and your cast and crew? I mean, that's, it, you know, that's, that's, that's a huge, huge question. I mean, I think the whole thing um, starts from a very, very young age and being told that this, is, this world is accessible for you, try it out, go, you know, really go for it. Um, I mean, what we're doing is looking at, we know that there have been a, a lot of schemes that have been set up. We're trying to look at where those have failed for people. We're trying to talk to alumni to see where it has worked and have conversations with people about how we can make a difference where good intentions have failed because we've actually got to make a concrete um, difference now. We can't just have another go at it. You know, we've got to make a massive difference. And we're looking um, really from the ground up. So just in terms of how you get entry, how you encourage people, how you support people, train people, give people real jobs so they're not sidelined in a sh on a show they're given a proper job and you know we always sort of pay properly for everybody no matter what sort of entrance level they are we pay properly because you can't expect people to fund their way into uh, into the industry um but also making um making positive um uh decisions to to hire people you know, going out of our way to find people and to hire people. Because I think it's not until you've got um, people from diverse racial backgrounds in positions where they can bring people on too, that you're going to mm. see a real sort of fundamental difference. I think, you know, I'm not an expert. I just make television programs, mm. right. but I have to, we've got to look at everything and, and, and use this opportunity to, create meaningful change. 
Well, I also think too, there needs to be more diversity at the corporate level to yeah. then empower the people like you to make those decisions. And I yeah. think the, cor the corner office factor, I think is what a lot of people are looking at too. It's one thing to have actors of color and stories about people of color, but unless there are people in the offices yeah. and in boardrooms, I think that's, you know, I, that's from right. my perspective, that seems to be a huge shift that needs to take place. Yeah. And, and for Shannon and, and uh, Miranda, you know, you work for yourselves. You're not part of a corporate entity. You're just trying to survive. <laughs> You've had to work really hard to get where you are. And it's hard. Um, I, I work for myself too. I'm a journalist. And it's hard to know, well, how do I prop up others when I've had to work so hard to get to where I am? And there's a sense of like, oh, I'm so exhausted just from my own career. What do you think each of us can do? And, I, and, I, and I'm asking this for myself as well to make sure that it is a level playing field. And it's not just Caucasian women who get these jobs now, it's, it's actually opened up. Do you, have you talked with friends about what, what each of us can do on that front because we don't have a corporate entity behind us? Maybe Shannon, you can start. Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, um, I, I don't really ever actually to get too exhausted by any of that because I think it's, um, you know, having grown up in Asia, as we talked about at the beginning, like for me, to see diversity everywhere in my life and in my workplace is what um, actually just brings me joy. And so it's something that I feel very passionate about. And what I think is important is, like we were saying, you know, in roles of writers and directors, these sort of lead creative roles or any heads of department, that is where we should be looking to make sure that it isn't all Caucasian. And also, you know, we have this thing that happens in Australia where we'll have lots of writing rooms. And then if there's a character that is a person of color in the story, they'll get consultants in. And these mm. consultants are incredibly talented writers in their own right. And they're having to come in and just give some feedback about some lines or a character and um, basically give it the tick of approval from them. But actually they should be writing one of the episodes themselves. Why aren't they in the room in the, the first place? place? Right. Exactly. So that's right. the, the thing that, there's a great article that just came out, I think, yesterday in Australia, written by a lot of amazing um, writers who are all people of colour and they were talking about, yeah, don't just have them as the note taker in the room and, and um, you know, it's about giving them their first break and they're all now incredibly successful themselves. So it is, it's, it's about in any environment and I think in any industry looking around and if everyone looks like you or is the same gender as you, whether that's male or female, um, that's, that's not a good representation, especially when you're making work where you're reflecting the world back to um, audiences. You know, that's what you need to really be thinking about. And I think as artists, we um, have a responsibility to make um, those changes. Right, to make shows that look like the world, essentially. Yeah. Right. And Miranda, what have you seen in, in your corner of, of the business? And does that sound similar to what you feel yeah, and have uh, experienced? Yeah, I mean, I think in England, certainly it feels like a very white industry. And I think you're very perceptive in talking about the corner office and who sits there and what that then dictates as to what we see on our screens. And if people feel like they're not represented, they're not going to be flocking to want to work in that industry because they right. already at the first hurdle feel not attracted and feel and not accepted or, you know, it's not culturally calling out to them. Hmm. So, I mean, I've, I've taken on three mentors this year, one of whom is a woman of color who uh, just so much talent, <laughs> so much talent. This I is men so mentees, not mentors, right? Mentees? I've taken, oh, sorry, mentees, yes. Okay. I, I am mentoring, <laughs> mentee. <Right. laughs> um, and, um, and I, and so I, that's a tiny thing to be able to do. And that was a scheme set up through um, women in film. And, um, and that is, and, she, and she's, she's doing really well. I feel like, she needs more help she needs more help from an establishment that's going to actually give her concrete opportunity which is what sally's talking about because mm. there's one thing about talking about good intentions and a lot of talk about tick, you know box ticking and that doesn't necessarily always materialize and so you've got to go back and look at why that doesn't materialize and i think a lot mm. of the time it's that people aren't attracted to the industry because it feels exclusive and it feels as though it's not inviting people beyond a quite a narrow white Caucasian um, little bubble to it and, and I think I mean there's a there's a program on um, the BBC at the moment by an amazingly talented 
young black writer director called Michaela Cole, who actually oh, stars. Oh, love in her. Yeah. Well, and mm -hmm. and you for the first time you see this world that feels vibrant, and it's sort of, you know, in the same way that I guess Phoebe with Fleabag really harnessed her own soul and projected mm -hmm. it on screen. This is happening, and yet so, and so suddenly this whole culture that we haven't really seen done in a in a in a real way that doesn't feel hackneyed or stereotypical is burst onto the screen and you think thank god you know this is mm -hmm. this is happening now but this is this is the first one and we're 2020 this is the first time i've seen this in england and this is 2020 so hopefully that'll open the doors to both people wanting to become part of the industry or wanting to to forge their own path through it and and to make their own work and have their voices heard in this medium and also allow for a, a widening of the of the gates to open to be much much more inclusive right and it's interesting i think hollywood has has shouldered has shouldered a lot of this criticism for a long time and and now we what we really understand is that this is global this is in australia it's it's in england it's anywhere content is created it's all over the world so i think now that we understand that it is global and not just los angeles <laughs> then mm, i think it's yeah. a little bit more manageable because maybe it feels more like a community sensibility approach as opposed to it's hollywood it's your fault which i think people start to feel like it's not just us you know yeah so i think that's been a good epiphany um that i've seen on yeah. unfold in the last few months i mean let's not forget we were having the same conversations about women only five years ago yes. less four, three years ago <laughs> You know, yes. it's nothing new. It's just no. it's the same story. We just have to be, we have to be much more self-aware in who we are, how we project ourselves and how we, how we reach out to the people around us and how we help the people around us to become who they can best be. Right. Well, it's a, a work in progress and I think we're all committed. So that's the good news. And in closing, um, and thank you all for your time in advance, because I know it's, um, well, poor Shannon's still awake, but we're going to catch her right before <laughs> she snoozes. <laughs> I do appreciate your time. And I'd love to know, what have you learned about yourself in the last few months, having been forced to be in this strange time at home, out of your routines, more isolated? Uh, and, and how do you think this experience will ultimately help you in your respective craft? Has it made you better at your job in some ways? Has it made you more creative? What do you think, Sally? Oh, God, it makes me feel very emotional, actually. Um, I think what it did right at the very beginning was, you know, and this is going to sound crass, but it did make me think really about how divided society is. And, mm. um, and I really hoped, and I still hope that um, the highlighting of... Um, you know, actually poverty mm. that we've seen um, will get addressed. Um, I also hope that the, the sense that we were all in this together would unite us. And I don't, sadly, I don't think it really has. I think it's just shown where the division is. But, you know, off the back of that, I, you know, that there needs to be some change. I think it's also from, a, you know, from a, a, a tiny little sort of selfish perspective, it's made me think about what actually really matters. I sometimes wonder whether television matters and I think it I think it does because I think we tell stories and those stories have got to be important but mm. you know I've got friends who are doctors um, Miranda's married to a doctor you know you just see what it's really about and um, I think it does make you question makes you question everything really um, and I hopefully that will make us you know better storytellers it doesn't mean there isn't going to be space for sort of you know, bubblegum television in the future mm. I think that that's got a huge place to sort of take people out of themselves but it's um it, the whole thing everything is existential including what we're going through you know at the moment in terms of um really uh looking and asking difficult questions about our own sort of unconscious racial bias you know it's it's um it's it's, it's huge <laughs> Hmm. And, it's, and it's interesting to think too, were it not for the pandemic, would we be having these conversations? Yeah. It's, you know, obviously George Floyd, his life may have ended without the pandemic. Yeah. But who knows how that shifted all I of know. our consciousness to this I know. bigger it's place. Absolutely. It's, a, it's very important for sure. It's very important. It's completely fascinating global experience. Hmm. It is. And maybe it'll bring us together. I guess time will talk. Yeah, I really, really <laughs> hope so. Me too. 
And for the directors, has it, has it given you a renewed sense of, of your craft? And has it made you look at it differently because you've been forced to do so? Miranda, you can start. I think yes and no. I mean, I, I feel helpless and impotent because I can't, I, there is nothing I can do to really allow, to, to help the industry along and to, to make it possible to work again. Um, I write, which is helpful because it's, this time is a nice time of seclusion to be able to have that. I do have two boys under the age of 10 and so it's, wow. it's turbulent. And I'm trying to carve out a bit of time here and there, but it is, it's not uninterrupted. And it's, um, you know, it, it's a fine balance to actually allow for it. But I think, I think in terms of change and what's happening in the world, and the world has never been more interesting. And so mm. that definitely sparks, triggers creative thought and process. And, and I've, you know, it, it's definitely allowed, given me, source for inspiration and and I think just all the conversations happening are suddenly so vital and so real and so philosophical and and you can't but help be drawn into it and want to try and you know you are as artists your your process is about, is about trying to make sense of the world is about trying to find your place in it and how how you can possibly try and make sense of it and so I think there is suddenly an urgency to try and do that mm. in whatever way you can and um yeah, in between the squabbles and the and the big things being flung around the room, I, I try and <laughs> try and do that. Bit. That could be very dangerous. <laughs> and Shannon, what are your final thoughts today? Um, look, you know, I do. I think it's a time where um, truth seems to really be bubbling to the surface, and that's happening at a micro and a macro level, and. Um, it's really sort of blowing up people's lives in a way that I think for many is incredibly painful. But I think, you know, like all kind of pain, there's a catharsis and, and, and people are, 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 I think, discovering a lot about themselves and, and the world. And it's, um, I think, a really invigorating time, despite how stressful it probably has been for most. So um, I'm really appreciative of the time to stop and to focus on these things. Hmm. Well, I want to thank all of you for your time today and also for making a show that we could watch during quarantine. It was perfect yeah. timing for season three. So well done. <laughs> I know you didn't plan that, but well done. And really appreciate all your hard work and wish you the best. Thank Thanks. you so much, Stacey. Thank, thank you. you.